this month we're doing the Annie Armstrong, we used to call it Annie Armstrong mission offering. Now it's yeah. California missions offering. And um, our goal is a thousand dollars. So pray about what the Lord might have you give, even though we've collected seventeen hundred and twenty dollars. So uh, pray about it. Still keep giving till the end of the month if we can. Today. Uh, today? Today at the end? Yeah. Today's oh, I thought it was the end of next month. Well, today is the, the yes, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, the end of the month ended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the first of the next month. So, hey, um, let's worship. Yeah. And Steve, I'm going to. Okay. Father God, how grateful we are for your kindness to us. The love you show us every single day. Your steadfast love. And may we find our rest in you. Gracious, gracious are you to us. Lord, bless the body in this day. May our hearts be united. And uh, may our uh, may our desire be to glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you. Good morning. We got some people sitting on the front row here who are critiquing what we do this morning. So I'm going to try to give it my best shot here. God bless y'all. Good to have you here, Pastor. We're hoping here just to, in a bit is going to lead us in the Lord's Supper. Um, always a memorable time. Always a sweet, sweet time. So keeping up on things, we uh, just want you to we want you to know how. The heart, I think the leadership here right now is still, the, the goal is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to trust him in every detail, and to know that ultimately he's in charge, how gracious our Lord is. Oh, yeah. You know, we all like to hear an encouraging word, you know, and as we read God's word, I hope that as you do, you're, you're encouraged. Oh, yeah, I hope you're convicted too, because uh, I sure am, as I spend time in God's word, but I hope that you're encouraged. We look for encouragement every in every well, so many different situations. Everybody likes to hear an attaboy or a you go girl. I don't even know what that means. Uh, but it's it's female thing. They say, you go girl. You gotta have a head thing. I don't know. I, I can't do that. Um, but we, we all need that encouragement and we, and we love that, you know, to be lifted up in some maybe simple way or a little nudge. The letter to Philipp uh, to Philippians <laughs> is actually two pages back from Colossians. Um, Paul, as he, uh, as he writes this, the Apostle Paul gives encouragement that proclaims eternal hope. It proclaims and it gives encouragement to a, a body of believers that Paul definitely loved and cared for and had spent some time with these folks. And he understood and they were, uh, they understood their heart. They understood his and uh, they were a true blessing to him. Let's just take a, a moment and we're Call upon the Lord, and then we're going to dig a little bit into here, into Philippians chapter 1. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, your word is a, is a lamp unto our feet, and it's a light unto our path. You guide us, Lord, sometimes just one step at a time, but you guide us. You are gracious beyond our expectations. You are merciful beyond anything that we deserve. And so your kindness, oh Lord, your love for us is revealed in your word. And revealed in, and revealed in the lives of those you have rescued and saved and brought into your family. Thank you, Lord, for adopting us into your family. And I pray that uh, in all things, that our heart's desire is to bring glory to your holy name. Bless this time and all that's done. May you be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah. Hey, we're going to take a look here. Verse, let me, I know. I'm Excuse me while I dig in my verse here. <laughs> He's turned off for me glass. I have like four pair. <laughs> I just got to remember to use them here. Do I look any smarter when I put these on? No. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let's read in there. In uh, verse, verse one, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's this is kind of a typical greeting, but as, as Paul says, uh, he greets him in this letter, he declares, not only is he a servant, he is a bond servant. He's a slave. Paul says, 
I'm a slave of the one who saved me. I know who, I'm, who my heart belongs to. I know who, who my life belongs to. And I'm his slave and I'm going to serve my master. And my and uh, that's that's awesome as he says that right there. Um, to the Philippian saints in Christ. To the Philippians, he says, to the saints in Christ. Now, he says he's going to use the in Christ phrase like 10 times in Philippians here. But he wishes them grace and peace. I mean, we could we could just camp right here. Do you enjoy the grace of our Savior, the grace of our Lord? Do you enjoy his grace, his unmerited favor, the kindness he's shown us, the peace that our God offers to each and every one of us, his mercy, his grace? He says, greetings, greetings. And um, I hope that you're grateful for his grace. I hope that as you as you look at your life and as you look at what God has done and, and is doing in your life, that it just it just uh Brings about an attitude of gratitude in all that you do and say. Hmm. Grace and peace. Grace, grateful for God's grace, grateful for his peace. Your father's grace and peace. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it shares that by grace we're saved, right? Through faith. Not a, That's not even of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. So no one can boast. I can't, I can't brag about, you know, what, what, a, what a treasure God got when he got me. Do you ever meet people like that in the family of God? Yeah, pray for them. You, and you can gently correct them if you want, but enter at your own risk, okay? Uh, you, might, you might be treading on thin ice when you approach them. But by grace through faith, he provides the grace, he provides the faith. He, prov he provides all of those things. Yet Paul says it is grace and peace that Jesus gives. He says the Father gives the grace and Jesus gives the grace. We've talked about this. Paul definitely believed in a triune God. He believed God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he's going to speak of the Spirit's activity a little bit later in the book of Philippians in his, in his letter to the Philippians. But he says there's a clear distinction, but there's still one. Because, and, and Okay, if you can get your head around that, if you can really get your you uh, come and talk to me, okay? All I know is it's what Scripture declares. And makes it very, makes very, very clear that our God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And Paul was definitely, definitely convinced of that. This is a grace that saves and continues to save us. This is a peace from our Heavenly Father and from our Lord Jesus that passes understanding. So breathe it in. Do you do that? Just to take a moment some days and just... You, you've seen that. You've seen that. Maybe it's a commercial or something, but just breathe. <laughs> you see that? I'm not going to say, say breathe and meditate on emptying or something. You know, go to it somewhere and get, trying to reach another realm. I'm just saying, maybe whisper the name of Jesus in prayer. Maybe a verse that runs through your brain, but just stop for a minute. Breathe and hold it in and just let that breath out. But think on the truth of God's word. Maybe, if, like I said, a favorite verse or the reality of how loved you are by God, regardless of the situation of what's going on in your life. Breathe it in and rest in the grace and peace of God the Father and God the Son. Verses, okay, uh, verses to three here. Let's say, I think I thank my God for every reminder of you, says in the MEV. In every prayer of mine for you all, I have always made requests with joy due to your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Just in those, those three verses right there, Paul's saying, I think of you often, and I thank God for you. Every time I think of you, I pray for you. Every time you cross my mind. Has anybody ever told you that? You know, every time I think of you, I pray for you. What, a, what, a, what a, an encouragement to hear. Hey, Paul's praying for us. Now, Paul made it to Philippi as far as, you know, I can tell a couple of times, but he spent some extended time with them there, and they loved him, and they responded to the gospel. These were, these were Gentiles, okay? Because mostly his references that you read in here, he doesn't bring a lot of the Old Testament in or anything. He's talking right to where they are, and I, it's, this is so encouraging right here. I thank God for you for every reminder of you. I thank God for you every time I remember you. Um, mm. You know, when someone comes to your mind, it might be possible that you're being nudged by God to pray for them. Maybe God's just nudging you a little bit, saying, hey, you need to pray for so-and-so. So be attentive to that. 
and, and just stop them and, and pray for them. Maybe even text them to let them know that you're thinking of them, you know, something simple. And that when you text, you know, or, or if you call them on the phone, you don't have to say, God spoke to me and you can't. No, don't do that. Don't do that because you're going to scare the, the whatever out of them. So don't do that. But just say, you know what? I've been thinking about you. How you doing? It's just that simple. You know, let them know that you're praying for them and praying that God is at work and moving in their hearts and lives. Got several friends like that. I just send them little notes, you know, little things. Hey, God bless your day, brother. Hang in there. You know, I know they're going through some, some difficult things, and I just send those off. Make praying for others as natural as breathing. So as we bring our brothers and sisters and, and people that are still outside the family that haven't trusted in Jesus, just make that a, a natural part of who you are. Don't don't think of that person. Oh, there's no way God could save them. Anybody besides me ever done that? And I mean, I, I'm, I shouldn't admit it, but I thought it. I thought if God could save them, holy cow, He can save and yeah. And we've seen and we've seen Him make and make His entrance in their lives and convince and convict them and rescue them and bring them into the family through belief in their in His dear Son Jesus. When somebody comes to your mind, just take a take a little little time to breathe and pray for them. Paul's prayers right here are, are just filled with joy. You know, Paul says, you know, every time I thank you, every time I thank you, and every prayer of mine for you all, I've always made requests with joy. I don't have to, he goes, you're not like those Corinthians. I'm didn't tell him, he doesn't say that. He doesn't make that comparison. But he says, every time I think of you, my heart is just full because I see God at work and moving in your hearts and in your lives and in the body of believers. And you're, you've been steadfast. In your faith in Christ, he says, every time I pray for you, every in every prayer of mine for you all, I have always made requests with joy due to, to our, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's saying from, from the moment I shared Jesus with you and you readily received him, you embraced the truth of the gospel, that hope was found in Christ alone, you received him. It brings me joy because you didn't just stop there. You continue to seek him and to grow and to feed that spiritual appetite that can only be satisfied in right relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus. He goes, I, he goes, did you fill my heart with joy? Yeah, he, he's going he's gonna to speak about some issues here a little bit. But he said, you know what? I know your heart and I know that heart's desire is to glorify and to honor God. From the first day, from the moment I first met you and shared the gospel, you have been faithful. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began, who, who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. These folks at Philippi have continued to be partners, uh, to partners in the ministry uh, with Paul from the moment they received him, received the gospel, until the present. Paul is confident not only of what God has done in the Philippians' life, but what he is going to do what he is going to continue to do. It is God who calls us to himself and saves us. It is God who works in us, perfecting our salvation. You're not going to be perfect, but you're going to be complete in Christ. You will be complete in him. And it is God who will complete our salvation when he calls us home. And that day when we finally see the fullness of our salvation, we see him face to face. Right now, we, if I asked y'all, we probably would have a little bit different picture of what Jesus looks like in our brain. You know, we, some, some of us, Jesus is, is you know, is, he might be, he's not, just let me help you. If you see a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, you need a backup, okay? He's probably about this tall, you know, ready in complexion. In fact, it, it says that when we see him, and I, I believe in Isaiah, it says we'll, we won't be too impressed with how he looks. Maybe that's a good thing. Because we're easily impressed with how people look or how things look. But our Savior, it wasn't how he looked, it's what he did. It's the lives he touched, the lives that he changed. Why do you think all those that he had that entourage of the apostles, the, the disciples that followed him? It wasn't because, you know, just how he looked, it's what he said, it's what he did, it's who he was, it's who he, re he revealed himself to be, the Son of the living God, to those who were following him. You and I are a work in progress, and we need to just continue uh, to encourage each other in this journey. And it is a journey. It is a journey. We were talking here today, and everyone goes, hey, guess what? How old I am? I said, oh, 35. He goes, no, 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 time's four. 
No, times three. 92. Okay, I didn't pass math 100. Didn't uh, I'm pretty good. Put your glasses back on. Later. Everett's up there. He's going to have a birthday in, in a couple of days here. And he's still just, there's a guy that has more drive uh, and ambition uh, and, and just stay in the course. And you're, you're an inspiration. Keeping, keeping, uh, keeping on course. And by the way, the sushi and stuff you get now, because he's out helping and getting the deliveries out here. Pretty awesome. Time is weird. It is a journey, and it's passing by quickly. But as as uh, as the Apostle Paul writes, he goes, you know what? I know this, that God will continue to work in you and will perfect your salvation uh, until the day of Christ Jesus, when we stand before our Lord. Verse 7, it says, it's right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my since both in my imprisonments and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are fellow partakers of my grace. For God is my witness, how I long after you all, how I long after you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul is most likely in prison, maybe just under house arrest as he writes this. Most likely he's in Rome. Um, the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to uh, to to want to assist Paul in his ministry and to be a comfort to him and also to take him uh, some finances to help meet his needs. And so this, this church at Philippi continues to be, uh, to be in connection with Paul and serving and, uh, and, and supporting him as he, as he shares the good news. In fact, them sending it, Epaphroditus, as we, can, as we read further, we find that he almost, he almost died. Not Paul, but Epaphroditus almost died in the process of, of getting getting to Paul, um, he said that the people at Philippi, at Philippi stood with him when others had distanced themselves. That they stood with him in a time when he was in prison, and he was in prison. Why? Because of the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He says, "You've been my fellow. You have been my fellow part partakers of my grace. You've been. You have. You need to." Uh, you have been a part of us experiencing the goodness of God, the kindness of God, and you have been a contributing factor in, in this ministry. It meant so much to him. He expressed his deep affection. He just expressed his deep affection for the, the believers in Philippi. In fact, you can almost hear him say, you know, I, I, I love you all. My I love you so much because of, of you, you stood by me. You've been faithful to the Lord. You've been consistent in your determination. Uh, to, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I, just, I love you with all my heart. He's getting really emotional here when he, when he says that. So you, can, you can really sense it. Verses 9 through 11 say this right here. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may, you may approve things that are excellent, so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge, the knowledge of our Savior, the knowledge of what God has done for us. Is as, we, as we hunger and thirst for righteousness, as we dig into God's word, spending time with our Lord every day in prayer, spending time with him in his word. Uh, it, as I was reading this passage, it, it just was so encouraging to me because the, the prayer of Paul here is, well, for one, Paul is not describing a, a blind love. He's describing a, a love that is, that is, is, is fixed on, on honor, honoring the Lord uh, a love that um, that that uh, like I say is is it's based on what we know on knowledge. It's based on a relationship. It's also based on our discernment to to be discerning, right? To, to make good choices, to make uh, to look at a situation and say, well, when I worked with youth all the time, and and I, I ask myself this as a as an older Christian, I'll ask myself, how is God going to be glorified? by this choice, if I do this? Will God be honored? Will he be glorified? And there are times I've got to say, no, he, he won't be. And I would ask kids, they would say, well, what do you think about this, this, and this? And they would ask some pretty 
pretty straight up questions. And I say, well, how, how is God going to glorify you? Is he going to? I got to quit touching this thing. Here, hold it. One, two, okay, there we are. It's got a little touchy something going on there. How will God be glorified? How will he be? Will he be honored at all? <clears throat> And when I, and then I was just, you know, make that discernment, that decision to be either, you know, to, to, to maybe not do something or do something else, uh, that's, that's maybe more in line with what God would have to do. But be a discerning follower of Christ. Be one who, who, who looks at the situation and, and makes that consideration that whatever we do in word or deed, we do all for the glory of God. Make that, make that determination. Make that, make that a part of who you are that, that is your desire. The knowledge that we talked about, love may abound in knowledge and discernment. The knowledge that we're talking about right here is founded on the solid rock of the scriptures. It's not simply a sentimental feeling. Although I got to admit, sometimes when I read scripture, I get all warm and fuzzy. Okay, I know it's weird. But it just, it gets you and you go, oh my goodness, Lord, your love for me. Your, your, Lord Jesus, your, your compassion for the, for the lost. Look how you, he reached out to people that, that all of a society would cast aside, but he would transform their lives. Okay, he would, he would, he would st- to anyone that would listen. He would speak to their need, and he would say, "Follow me, trust me, take up your cross and follow me." Knowledge that is founded on the solid rock of the Scripture. It's not just strictly sentimental feeling. The, uh, this verse is very descriptive of a Christ-like love, a love that is sacrificial, a love that glorifies the Heavenly Father. Loving in a way that blesses others, and a love that's growing and maturing each and every day. In other words, it's not just, oh yeah, I love people. No, it's you're going to have to work at it, and God's going to bring people in your life that are going to be spiritual sandpaper that you're going to have to love. And you know what? I've, I've been a Christian since I was eight years old, and he's still torturing me with people that drive me crazy. That he brings into my life. I go, I gotta love this person, Lord. Okay, there are people that love me, and they're probably I'm a spiritual sandpaper. So just back up and say, Lord, help me to truly reflect the love of Christ in, in, in relationship to this person. A love that's growing and maturing each day. It's also a love revealed in the choices we make as discerning holy followers of our gracious Heavenly Father. His Son and His Son, our risen Savior Jesus, and the ever-present Holy Spirit. This love that God is talking about, we, I'm, I couldn't help it. I've got to, I got to go back over to First Corinthians thirteen for just a minute. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do the whole passage or anything. But in First Corinthians uh, thirteen, uh, just, just four, starting at four. And this isn't, this isn't the kind of love that the world talks about. Paul says, "Love suffers long; it's kind." Love envies not, love flaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself improperly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. Herein is love, folks. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's love. And it's a sacrificial love. We can't do this on our own, by the way. You can't just drum up some emotion and say, I'm just going to, man, I'm going to love people today. No, God help you to love him every day. Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. Give me the courage to love. And, and it, I don't mean just a warm, fuzzy feeling, but to always make those decisions that are going to be in the interest of others because we care about what God is doing in their life. Uh, this isn't the kind of love that the world understands or embraces. But this is a love that's only possible in a life surrendered to God. That's the only way it's possible. And we see all kinds of different misrepresentations of what love is. But there's only one love that's eternal. Only one love that truly makes, it, makes a difference in our lives. And that is the love of Christ revealed in us. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in. What a great verse. I know we read, read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but make sure you stick 10 on there because you are God's workmanship. Some of these new modern versions say you're his masterpiece. Okay, whatever that means. But you are, you know, because you are being, you're, you're a brand new creation in Christ. 
It says in Colossians, you're a brand new creation. The old has passed away. You become a new creature in Jesus. How encouraging is that? Christ in you, you're our, your hope of glory. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. I just want to read 9 through 11 again here, just kind of in closing. And in uh, Philippians chapter 1. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more, broadly, in knowledge and in all discernment. That you may approve things that are excellent, so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of the Lord. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'll tell myself in front of you what I always tell myself. Uh, when something like that overwhelms me. Remember that breathe part? You got to suck oxygen in, right? Because if you don't, then you make snorting sounds with your nose. Because your sinus is just like, oh, okay, I'm all right there. Uh, this passage is filled with such rich encouragement. Rich, rich encouragement. I would echo Paul's prayer that our lives may be filled and overflow with the sweet aroma of Christ who is our hope and our glory. I hope that our lives overflow with the good works, the holiness of Christ in us. May we hunger for Christ in us as he does his works of righteousness that bring praise and glory to God. Anything I do, wood, hay, and stone. Boom. Christ in you, our hope of glory. Christ in you, working through in and through us. God is glorified. But to do it just in my own mind, and my own strength, in my own praise and glory, it doesn't work. So let me say it again. As we look back, just glance back here, family. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Hmm. Father, we can't even begin to fathom your, your great love for us. But we've seen it revealed, Lord. We've seen it revealed in your son, Jesus. We've seen it revealed in the, in the changed lives of folks that are sitting here today. We've heard it from your word proclaimed today, Sunday after Sunday, year after year, Father, by our faithful pastor. We've heard, Father, uh, the stories of the successes of life of the, of the, in the of folks that are in the battle, Father, that are, that are staying the course regardless of what, what the world throws their way or what challenges they may face. But, Father, we fix our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith knowing that he who has begun a good work in us is faithful to complete that work uh, until the day of Christ Jesus, till the day you call us home, Lord, till the day that we, uh, till the day that we can see you face to face. Our, phrase, our gracious Lord, we just want to tell you that we love you. I thank you for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of folks here in this day, Lord, and pray that in all things that we seek to honor and glorify you. First and foremost, that we love the body, that we love this world, Father, so lost, and so destitute of hope, Father, I pray that, that you would open our mouths and that you would work in and through us. That we might be that sweet aroma of hope of Jesus in the world and in the, in the paths that you lead us down in each day. Bless my brothers and sisters here today. And may we honor you now in Jesus' holy name as we partake of holy communion with the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> We've got this rookie pastor coming this way, folks. He's going to lead us in the Lord's Supper. Let me make some adjustments. Good morning, everyone. This is all about Jesus. Help us. Brief testimony. I've learned in the last month or so, but especially in the last week or two, uh, what some of you already knew is when you just don't think you could breathe another minute, the Lord is always there. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Sometimes down at Balboa, then, then I wondered if I would make it. It just seemed like uh, the pain was just so horrible. From a simple procedure that went wrong. And no medicine showed up for 90 minutes, but the Lord showed up. He didn't deliver me from it. 
He delivered me through it. Um, I've read, I, I, as far as I can tell, looking around the room, as far as I know, everyone here has um, received Christ as Savior. But just in case, number one, and then if you would be interested, I stole this from three or four really good preachers uh, about to explain the gospel. And that, that's why we're here. It's the gospel. The good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. It's all been accomplished. And all our failures, all we've got to do is receive the key. All that's necessary for your salvation is faith and repentance. Can you remember that to tell somebody? Is anybody nervous? Somebody must be nervous. Because you want me to say obedience. No. True salvation produces obedience. You with me? The gospel commands believing that Jesus is who he said he was, true God, and trusting in Jesus' payment for your sins on his cross. That's faith. Secondly, repentance. A true sense of your own guilt and sinfulness. A hunger for God's mercy in Jesus. An actual growing hatred of sin, especially your own. And then afterward, a persistent endeavor to live a life that's pleasing to God. Is that where you are? Some may say, well, how can I be certain? 1 John 5.13 says that I can be certain, but I'm not certain. Well, Romans 8.16, Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit himself, this is the verse, this Holy Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. When the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit, he's looking at your faith and your repentance. And praise God, even your faith and repentance have been granted to you by God. You're sealed. You're good to go. You're rapture ready. Someone may still say, but what about baptism? It's commanded in the Bible. That's obedience. Remember we said the gospel produces obedience. John 14, Jesus says, the one who obeys me is the one who loves me. And then he says, the one who does not obey me is the one who does not love me. So if you got Christians running around that are spectacularly disobedient, <clears throat> got to go talk to them. And then some may say, you got to be sinless. Because 1 John, no. 1 John, the very first chapter says, anyone who says he does not sin, they're a liar. Includes me, especially. Remember, your Christmas Christian life is not perfection. It's the direction. And that's the verse that Steve shared with us this morning. Philippians 1 6. I'm confident of this very thing that he began a good work. We'll continue to perform. That's the direction until the day of Christ Jesus. And the translation that Steve ran read out of, he says, we'll, 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 we'll take care of it all the way to perfection. But that's uh, that's that that's up there with him. Perfection. So, gentlemen, if you would come forward, we'll receive the Lord's supper. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the preaching, proclamation of your word, and how wonderful the love of Jesus is, and how sweet the fellowship of the saints becomes. All because 
you made us the body of Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread. It didn't look like this. A chunk of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Jesus, the life, eternal life is in the blood of Jesus. Oh Lord, may it be so for every single person in this room. On out to our loved ones and our neighbors. We live not afraid to talk about the blood of Jesus, not to be trite with it, silly about it, cheap with it, to treasure that you love us so much that you sent your son to spill his lifeblood for our salvation. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a brief explanation of what happened right here. You ever been to a mass? I'm that guy in that robe. Presumptuously, presumptuously drinks out of the cup and nobody else gets any. And he's drinking it himself. Mercy on it. We, we all this is symbolic. It's that everything that we get from the Lord is a gift. Especially the salvation. It comes in Jesus. Are you with me? Do you understand? No, that's just a gesture. Not a big deal. I would mean, never, never forget that, uh, that, that the pastor or the Bible teacher or whoever, the leaders, they sit on their tail and Jesus comes and washes their feet. Washes it with this blood. With that uh, scripture that Steve presented to us earlier, Titus 3, 4 and 5, I think it was. Precious, precious, not by righteous things that we've done. <laughs> and so we come to. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper. And after he had supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Steve was talking about breathing earlier. It's everything he consumed. Everything that we can sing, including the air, all a gift. There's a song about that. Steve probably knows it off the top of his head. But, uh, 